Hi, thanks for joining me. My name's Emily Rhodes. In this month's webcast, I'm gonna be talking to you about The Hair with Amber Eyes by Edmund Duval. It's a great book. It's the Netsky book. Um, I, I can't hear the word Netsky without remembering when I worked in a bookshop, we had a stack of these piled high and this lady came in, um, saw them. It's like, it's the Netsky book, it's the Netsky book, it's the Netsky book, it's the Netsky book. And she just kept shouting it like this stuck record um, to her husband. <laughs> he looked completely embarrassed and bewildered. Anyway, it is the Netsky book. Um, what are Netsky? What's so special about them? I think that's the kind of heart of this book, which, you know, the reason I love it so much and why I think it's done so well and is so extraordinary is to me, it, it felt like the first time somebody had taken a thing, you know, the Netsky in this case, and through the prism of this thing, told so many other stories. So Emma Duval, who is a potter, talks about how the Netsky, which I will tell you in a second what they are, come into his family, you know, a few generations ago and what role they had in his family. But also through that, you get this kind of microcosm of European history of the 20th century. So it works on so many layers and it's kind of amazing the way he ties it all together through the Netsuki, the hair with amber eyes. Um, Netsuki are Japanese small, finely made carved objects. They were originally, I think, um, toggles that were often on the end of a kimono cord or a bag. So I think he says in the book that each one fits in the palm of his hands. So they're quite small and they're made to be held, to, to go around with you on your day-to-day -day life on the street, not not to be left at home on display, but to, to be in your hand, to be in your pocket, to be um, touched. And he writes really well about touch um, and the feeling of these, but also he really shows how these Netsuki meant something quite specific and quite different to each member, um, each holder of the Netsuki through, through, through the generations, through his family. So we don't have that long, but I'll try and um, kind of cover some, some of the ground of the book. We, we begin with Charles, um, Charles Afrisi, who comes to Paris in the mid 19th century. The Afrisi are a, a banking family, a Jewish banking family, originally from Odessa. They made their money through grain. Um, and I'll just have a little aside here to say how extraordinary it was reading this book in light of the horrific situation in Ukraine at the moment. It really, time and again, it's impossible not to find resonances um, with what's going on there at the moment. And it kind of reinforced to me just how different a book can be each time. Um, each time you read it, depending on where you are in your life, depending on what else is going on in the world. This book, reading this now, um, felt very different to me to reading it 10 years ago. Um, so anyway, to begin with Charles, the Jewish banker who comes to Paris, everyone knowing he's incredibly rich, but he wants to prove that he is also a man of taste, a man of culture. Um, he loves beautiful things and writing about beautiful things, um, commissioning them, he collects them. And at the time there was this, the beginnings of this craze for Japanese, Japanese beautiful things in Paris. And Charles is at the vanguard of that. And he buys this collection of 264 Natsuki for his salon. Um, of course, at the end of the, of the 19th century, the Dreyfus affair happens, which you know, lasts about a decade. But I think that just really shows how anti-Semitism was so in the air, it was, it was so palpable, and how much Charles had to fight against in an, in an effort to 
prove his his cultural worth. But like like many great collectors, he you know he keeps on collecting and he um, he needs to make space and he gives them away this collection to Victor um, who's getting married and to Emmy, his wife. And they, the Netsky then go from Paris to Vienna and they arrive in Vienna at the beginning of the 20th century. And here their home is another very grand, a frusy place on the Ringstrasse. But here the Netsky aren't on display in a kind of salon or ballroom, they're put in Emmy's dressing room. And we all felt on the walk so I should say, this was the pick for Emily's Walking Book Club. We meet once a month on Hampstead Heath. Um, come along. We also meet on Zoom. Um, yes, here, on the, on the walk, we all felt this is where the next key come alive. And Emmy ha has them in this intimate, private space where she gets dressed. And, you know, getting dressed then is really different to throwing on your clothes. It takes, you know, a good hour and it happens several times a day. And it involves her servant, Anna, sewing her into her clothes. Um, it's also the time that her children spend with her. They spend an hour a day with her as she gets dressed, um, which is, is kind of an extraordinary thought and really sad in a lot of ways. And we wondered how awkward that relationship might have been but the Netsuki here are playthings for the children and also storytelling things. You know, there, there are so many worlds that they conjure, so many tales, so many ideas. Um, each one is this kind of little nobule of imaginative explosion. And it's nice to think of Emmy telling stories about the Netsuki to, to her children and her children inhabiting those worlds. Unfortunately, in, in the real world of that time, of course, the Nazis were rising to power, the Anschluss happens. And although we know it's going to happen, when that kind of crisis occurs in the book, it is really shocking. It is really powerful and moving and and horrific and we see you know this life of accumulation of of all these beautiful things and cultural status and money it that's all been acquired over the last couple of generations it just goes just like that um and Elizabeth, we kind of, we hear, we sort of follow Elizabeth, one of the children who comes to England. And Edmundville writes about her return to Vienna in December 1945, where Anna, the maid, has remained in the house. And while the Nazis have been busy taking everything away and cataloguing them all, Anna takes the Netsky a few at a time in her apron pocket and hides them in the mattress of her bed. And Elizabeth sees her and Anna gives her the Netsky back. And it's just, you know, jaw dropping, stomach dropping when you when you read of this, this amazing thing that has happened. And of course, this idea of hiding things is so powerful in the Second World War where so many Jewish people hid, were hidden, not hidden well enough. Um, and, and also the idea of Anna herself being this kind of hidden person, this, the servant rooms were, were on a hidden floor without real kind of windows onto the street. Um, and her surname isn't known, and so she's not really traced in the book. I'm going to read a tiny bit out from her. I know we don't have much time, but I think it's worth reading a bit of it. So this is when Anna gives Elizabeth back the Netsky. The Netsuki had been moved around before. Ever since they had arrived from Japan, they had been appraised, picked up, examined, weighed in the hand, placed again. That is what dealers do. It is what collectors do, and it is what children do. But when I think of the Netsuki in Anna's apron pocket, with a duster or a spool of thread, I think that these Netsuki have never received so much care. 
Um, okay, with, with Anna sp sleeping on them, the Netsky are looked after with more respect than anyone has ever shown them. She has survived the hunger and the looting and the fires and the Russian invasion. Um, and then he writes about them being in her mattress and says, touch is not only through the fingers, but through the whole body too. Each one of these Netsky for Anna is a resistance to the sapping of memory. Each one carried out is a resistance against the news, a story recalled, a future held on to. Then he says, um, there is no sentimentality, no nostalgia. It is something much harder, literally harder. It is a kind of trust. And again, you know, we think of all Ukrainians sheltering in basements, kind of resisting, having this trust, and it feels so powerful. Um, anyway, we go on to Elizabeth in England, where the Netsky, so sorry, I should say, I think for Anna, in some ways, the Netsky were, you know, a symbol of resistance. Elizabeth, for Elizabeth, they become a symbol of all that was lost. You know, that's all she has. And she fights so hard to try to get everything else back and some kind of rap reparation. They have no money, the family at this point. And such anger comes through in the book here, the horrific injustice of it. Um, and the, the kind of grief and anger at, at so much loss. And incidentally, I have here two of Elizabeth Duval's books, which are published really beautifully by Persephone. Um, the Exile's Return is about her return to Vienna. It's so raw and so powerful. It really, there's this moment where they ask the question, you know, what were you doing in the war? You know, how did you survive? And the answer is always quite grim. And Milton Place is um, all set in, in England. It's, again, a, a great book. So two good bits of further reading. So Anna has them and they're, they're almost this, these objects of anger at, at how much is lost. And so much, she trains as a lawyer. She's this great heroine, Elizabeth. She, you know, fights to get to the university and then she becomes this lawyer and she's really trying hard and just coming against bureaucracy and uselessness and a lack of people wanting to help um, recover, you know, what, what was theirs and what they need. And then Iggy comes back Iggy is gay and has been in America. So he's sort of such an outsider and gets, sees the Netsky. He doesn't know where he's going to get, where to go next. There's these two different offers, one of which is in Japan. And he sees the Netsky and he decides to take them home. He goes to Japan with the Netsky, he kind of brings them back. They've come this amazing full circle. And here they exist in Iggy's, drawing room in a way that is a, a kind of echo of Charles's. They, they feel talked about part of their life. And, um, and it's a really nice um, kind of closing echo. Although it did make me wonder more about the kind of prehistory of these Netsky. You know, what, where were they made? Who made them? What, what was their life before they came into the Afrusi family? And I kind of wish there'd been a bit more of that in the book. And then we come on to Edmund, who gets them last of all, and his kind of quest. And what's so lovely about this book is how you're with Edmund de Waal all the way through. You're kind of sitting beside him in the archives. You're walking beside him down the streets. You're really rooting for him on this quest. Um, and I think it, it's very, it's very involvingly written. You you almost feel like you yourself have discovered the story of the Netsky themselves. But also he kind of makes his peace with leaving some, some things unsaid. And at some point, the quest for, for knowing everything has, has to be stopped. Um, which is probably a good time to, time to end this, this webcast. Thank you for joining me. Um, I hope to see you next time.